Well, hey everybody, my name is Aaron. Welcome back to the channel. I recently acquired this Commodore 1802 monitor. Yes, you heard me right, not a 1701 or 1702, and not a 1084. It's somewhere in between. So today I want to take a look at what sets this monitor apart from other monitors that were released around the same time, and of course, we need to see if it works. It's coming up right now on the Retro Hack Shack. So before I do anything else, I want to take a brief look at where this monitor sits in the Commodore monitor timeline. And Commodore released dozens of monitors and several of them within short succession over the years between, say, 1983 and 1986. So the first one I want to look at is the 1701 or the 1702. The only difference being that the 1701 came with a five pin cable for the early C64s that came out with five pins for the video connection. And then the 1702 shipped with an eight pin connector to match the eight pins that were on the later revisions of the Commodore 64. It was released in 1983 and it supported composite, Luma and Chroma signals as inputs. And the nice thing about this monitor, of course, is that it has the composite right on the front. So it makes it very easy and neat to connect the Commodore 64 to the composite input. Most of these monitors, as far as, far as I know, were made by JVC. Next, we have the model that we're going to be talking about today. This is the 1802, and this monitor came in several different variations, even though they were all called 1802. The first of which was released in 1984, and it was really targeted towards the C16 and the Plus 4, which had a short lifespan, but that's what they were thinking with this particular model. This monitor has composite and Luma Chroma inputs, and some of the later versions had a mono input, which I'll talk about more in a, in a minute. And these monitors were made by either Gold Star or Daewoo, depending on which one you get. And then there was a 1901 and 1902 monitor, the difference there being that the 1901 monitor was the PAL version and the 1902 was the NTSE version. This was released just the next year in 1985 and this was to support the Commodore 128. So this had all of the signals as the other monitors did with the exception of mono, I guess, but it also supported a digital RGBI signal for the Commodore 128. Now, if you bought the PAL version, this is probably made by Thompson, and if you bought the NTSC version, it was most likely made by Fujitsu. Last but not least, because I mentioned it in the opening as one of the more popular Commodore monitor models, we have the 1080 series of monitors. There were a number of these released with different model numbers, with slightly different features, and also supporting different types of either PAL or NTSC signals. It was first released in 1985, and of course this was released for the Amiga. It had all of the uh, previous inputs, composite, Luma, Chroma, digital RGBI, but it also had analog RGB available as well. These were made either by Toshiba, Philips, or Daewoo. Now if you search really hard, you'll even find a 1070, which I consider to be in the same family, but that is extremely rare and it seems to be very limited numbers of those were produced in the very early days of the Amiga. Okay, now let's dive in specifically to the 1802 because as I said, there were multiple versions of this monitor manufactured as well. The first one being the 1802 that I have sitting on the table here in front of me. This version of the monitor was released in 1984. It was manufactured by Gold Star, as I mentioned, but this monitor is also known under the Gold Star brand as the CMC 141. So you'll see a little bit later when we start digging into the schematics that they say CMC 141, and that is because they are essentially the same monitor. So if you ever see uh, that monitor, you might want to pick it up for use with your Commodore 64 or C16 and plus four as it was intended in this case. The next version of the 1802 came a few years later and it's basically the same monitor, but in a beige coloring. So this is a painted monitor and they painted this particular version beige, I guess to at that point match the systems that were out in the market today. But otherwise it's the exact same system. 
Next up, we have an 1802 that was released again in 1986. This time they changed manufacturers to Daewoo and they added a mono port in the back. Now this mono port is not really the best for dealing with 80 column mode. I guess it will display uh, the video signal in 80 column mode, but it's not designed for high resolution mono video input. So just be aware if you get one of these thinking it's gonna be great for 80 column mode, you may be disappointed. And last but not least, uh, in 1988, they released yet another version of the 1802. This time they called it the 1802D. So if you see this particular one, it has updated styling to align with the systems that were out at that time. But it's a very, very similar monitor, also made by Daewoo, same ports and everything in the back. So now let's take a look at the monitor that I have. And as you can see, it's got the Commodore rainbow logo emblazoned brightly on the front of the monitor, which I just love. It's also got a power button, volume knob, and brightness knob on the front. Although these knobs are quite loose and I hope they haven't become disconnected from the motherboard at some point because that would kind of be a pain. And the power button for this particular monitor is over here on the left with a nice big round power button instead of being up front or on the back. Another thing you've probably noticed by now is that the Gold Star monitor comes with this, or is supposed to come with, this plastic covering in front of the CRT. This helps protect the CRT, but it does get scuffed up over time. And so I may have to look at ways that, to help clean this thing up so that it doesn't detract from viewing the actual CRT screen itself. This particular model seems to be in really good shape, except for some stickers with the accompanying residue, I'm sure, on the top here, and some scuffs where this thing has probably gotten moved around a dozen or so times over the course of its lifetime. Taking a look at the back of the monitor, of course, we've got the Commodore logo again with this big warning sticker and the model number and manufacturer's date over there on the far end. Speaking of which, you can see this particular monitor was manufactured in November of 1984. Ah, what a good year. The video input ports as well as the adjustment knobs for this particular monitor are very inconveniently located underneath the back of the CRT tube. And this makes it really difficult when you've got this sitting on a table to plug anything in or make any adjustments, as I'll find out later. Now here you can see the audio and video inputs for Lumachroma and Composite, and they each have their own audio input. So you could really have two Commodore 64s, let's say, hooked up to this thing at the same time and just use the switch on the back to go back and forth, as hard as it may be to reach. And of course, the picture adjustment knobs for tint and color, etc., etc. And we have the sticker here for the manufacturer, which indeed is Gold Star. So the next thing to do was to plug this thing into a Commodore 64, power it up and see if it worked. Unfortunately, when I hit the power, I only got a raster. So good news is I'm getting power and it looks like the monitor is trying to work correctly. And by the way, this flickering was not visible. It's a artifact of the uh, video camera. And even though I tried both Lumachroma and composite inputs on this thing, I just could not get the image to appear on the CRT. It was almost like there was no signal being passed through to the monitor. So with that in mind, it was time to open this thing up and take a look inside. While I take this cover off, let's take a minute to thank the sponsor of today's episode, PCBWay. PCBWay offers inexpensive PCB manufacturing and a whole lot more. Need assembly services? No problem. They can do front side, back side, through hole components, you name it. They also offer 3D printing, CNC milling, and more. So check out PCBWay for your next project, and I thank them for their support of the Retro Hack Shack. Now that I've got the cover off, just a warning, you need to be really careful uh, if you're dealing with CRTs and you plan to go inside, please, please, please know what you're doing so you don't get a shock. Uh, that would be a nasty surprise. There's high voltage in here, so try to remember to say that every time. Sometimes I forget, but yeah, if you don't know what you're doing, just stay away from CRTs unless you can get some training or maybe partner up with someone that's worked on these before and see if they'll show you the safety ropes. That's a great way to go. Maybe somebody at your local makerspace can help out. One thing I see right away is that the uh, back of the motherboard here is exposed, which is really good because that'll be really helpful for testing. The bottom of the board looks pretty clean. I don't see a whole lot of corrosion or anything, but let's tip this up and we can get a better look inside. 
So this is all the high voltage side of the board here. We've got the uh, the big, there's always a, usually one or two of these big resistors here. Transformer back here, um, some big caps, filter caps and so forth on the uh, on the main side. And there is a fuse down in there, but we know the fuse is okay because the tube came on and was trying to display a picture. I do see down there in the middle, there's a little bit of gunk coming out. Well, I don't think it's coming out, actually. I think it's probably hot snot that they use to keep that capacitor from wiggling around uh, and vibrating. But it appears to be also on that diode down there. And I'll have to see if I can... Just test that diode out too. I'm pretty sure that's just some sort of adhesive, but if it is, if that big cap is leaking, that would be very odd. They don't usually leak. And then down in there is where I want to really get a better look to see if there's any caps that are uh, perhaps leaking, see if there's anything uh, that's blown, maybe transistors or anything like that. Maybe I'll have to trace the signal coming in from the back of the unit and see where it goes and maybe Maybe there's a component in there that is uh, is just fried. I mean, it would be great if it was as simple as a capacitor, but I'll have to get in there and take a closer look. Well, I'm taking a look at these pots now, and the good news is they're just loose. They're, the wires are connected. There's no issues, um, but they're both just loose. So there'll be a nut on the front of the pot now that I've taken the uh, dials off, the uh, plastic dials and should just be able to tighten that up. So there's nothing really broken there. That's the good news. That's why they still felt like they were turning okay. And yeah, you can see this is this was the problem here. This just loose. That's all. This just needs to be tightened up. So um, I'm just I went ahead and took this out and I'll just tighten this up with a little wrench here until it's nice and tight. And uh, yeah, that'll fix that problem. No sweat. Well, I've had a good look at the board and I'm not seeing any glaring issues at this point, at least. There's no blown caps. There's no burnt out resistors or diodes. Um, there's no leaking caps or bulging caps. Uh, I, I can't really see anything glaringly wrong. And I know that the tube works because that seemed to power up and it just didn't look like it just wasn't getting any signal. So that leads me to believe one of two things. Either there's a physical problem somewhere, like for example, maybe this switch, which switches back and forth between composite and Luma Chroma mode could be faulty or not passing any signal through at all. Maybe it just needs a little bit of deoxid to clean it up. Maybe there's a pot. There are a lot of pots on this board for fine tune adjustments and some of the other functions that aren't available on the back of the board through those pots. So maybe one of those pots is old enough now that it's developed either some sort of a gap where it's not making good contact and that's keeping the signal from passing through the board. Or maybe in the flow of the signal itself, which I may have to trace out, there's a resistor or a cap or something like that that the signal goes through that is just uh, open. It's maybe it's maybe there's a cap that's blown open or something like that that's not allowing the signal to go through. Um, it doesn't look like a deflection prop problem, so I'm not even really looking yet at the horizontal or vertical deflection parts of the board because that would manifest itself in a different way. You'd see part of a picture, it would be distorted, maybe things would be shrunken either vertically or horizontally or something like that. And I'm just not seeing that. So I think the first thing to do is to go through and maybe uh, wiggle or uh, use some deoxid on some of the physical connections on the board and just make sure that those are okay. Hook it back up, try it, see if it works. So that's gonna be step one. And then step two is going to be, like I said, to try to diagnose where that video signal goes along the path um, and see if there's anything that gets in the way. There are a couple of ICs on the board as well. So if one of those was good and truly blown, then that could also, I would assume, manifest itself in this way where the video signal is perhaps getting to those chips and then just stopping completely. Now, if you are also working on a Commodore monitor, I would highly recommend going to this site that I found that has information on pretty much every Commodore monitor ever made. And it also includes PDFs of the, usually the user manual and the service manual. And speaking of service manuals, this one is exactly how I would like a service manual to be. It includes circuit descriptions or theory of operation, block diagrams, test point locations, the ways to adjust the monitor for the best picture. It includes 
not only a schematic, but waveforms of what those patterns should look like at the certain test points that they describe. And yeah, it has everything you would want in a service manual. So great job, I assume, by Gold Star in this case. So let me work on that and then we'll come back and try this out. Okay, so so far all I've done is kind of wiggle all the physical connections that I could think of that could be interrupting the signal. That includes pots and switches and things like that. So this is plugged back in, which is why my hands are not going past this point of the uh, monitor, uh, except to hit the power button. Commodore 64 is on, so let's see what we get. Okay, you've got high voltage. I did turn the brightness down as well. I really don't like that inrush of power. Okay, turn the brightness up a little bit. Oh, look. This was definitely not there before. Okay. <laughs> I got lucky. I thought I was going to have to do a lot more troubleshooting than this. So one of those things, I'm not sure which one, there was some physical connection that was not right. It could have been the wires, it could have been the switch, it could have been the pots. But those are the things that I touched and I'm definitely seeing Commodore 64 here. So let me carefully uh, try to get this back into focus and sync here. Okay, so here we go. This is about as good of a picture as I've seen on a CRT tube for a Commodore 64. I mean, this just looks really, really good. So all it was was a physical connection somewhere and that appears to be resolved. Sometimes it's best to look at the simplest things first before you go too crazy. So always check those physical connections, folks, before you uh, rule something out as bad. Okay, so I still don't feel very comfortable with these colors and I don't have a reference image where I could just hook up a signal to the back of this. That would be the best way to test this particular monitor out and make sure the colors are set correctly. So I'm going to attempt to do something a little different. First of all, I went out and I grabbed a couple of uh, color reference programs that I could find. There's, um, there's a few on here, but basically what I just need is a color palette. If you're working on a PAL system, there's a really good one called Test Build, B-I-L-D, Test Build. And that one, unfortunately, is all in German. And it also is PAL, uh, it's meant for a PAL system. So the image is, appears elongated for a uh, NTSC type monitor. And you can see it goes off the screen here. But it is a really cool program. It has some sound testing abilities where you can test the different sound. And I don't know how to turn that off actually, but it does let you test different colors like red, green, and blue. So that looks like red. That actually looks, doesn't look too bad. Green, blue. It does have a nice bar here where you can actually see what the detailed pitch of your monitor is and whether these lines are actually appearing correctly on the screen, and they are. Um, it's got a single line test where you could uh, perhaps move this left or right to get it centered. It's got just a bar here. This is actually pretty interesting. This is appearing correctly well, even though it's stretched out, it's actually appearing pretty centered on the screen. And it does have the various colors. And uh, so you could use this as a pattern to test with. So that's one option. And if you just want to test colors, this may be a good thing to use, even if you're working on an NTSC system like I am, because you could use these colors to fine tune, do your fine tuning of your, your tint on your colors. PAL, uh, I don't believe has tint. That wasn't a thing that they had. Uh, it just, just worked over there the way that PAL worked. The colors were, I think, al always going to be accurate. Whereas in North America, you have the little tint control and that can change the, what the colors look like on your set. Another one I found, which is pretty good, is this little program called SMTPE, which stands for the standard color palette. I, I, actually, I don't know what it stands for, but it is the standard color palette that you'll see if you were to hook up a certified uh, test signal to the back of your monitor. So that looks like this. And perhaps you've seen this before. It's not quite the same as the standard SM 
PTE, but it does have the various colors, and certainly this would be a good thing to use. This was written by Rob Lind Lindeman. Rob Lindeman. You can change the colors and change the time and things like that. It's it's it's, it's kind of neat. It's kind of interesting. But what I decided to use was this demo disc that came with the 1541 drive. And it came about 1985. There are some that are previous to this. This happens to be called 1541 Demo 3. So if you search for that, you'd probably find it. And it has some extra utilities on it. And one of them is actually going to show us color on the screen. And there we go. So now I have a screen um, over here that is the color demo. And it actually should look very similar to the one that I have running on the laptop. So on the laptop, I'm running Vice. And I'm running Vice to get a consistent environment in which to display these pictures. Now, this is all subjective because the colors on my laptop, of course, can be tweaked. And so what I'm actually seeing could be different than um, something else. Likewise, this C64 that I'm going to be displaying these colors on, you know, could have uh, resistors or capacitors that are slightly off by a certain percentage from their nominal value, and that could be affecting the colors that we're seeing on the monitor. But this will get us pretty close, I think. So the first thing I want to do is load the, I'll show you the color demo here. And that puts out a little palette of the colors on the C64. And likewise, I can do the same thing here. Now this looks a whole lot better to me, but it's actually, I can tell it's a little bit off. So instead of having purple around the border, we have blue. Uh, the purple is, looks purple to me, but it's actually the purple on the C64 should be a lot pinker. So I can definitely see that the colors are off. I'm actually going to be using the NTSC bar chart demo because that gives us something a little bit more familiar. And if I hit F3 over here, there we go. So there you can see how off things are. This red over here should be more brown. The purple and the light purple over here should be more purpley, I guess. Right now they're very blue. And I actually, like I said, I prefer this color palette here, but to make it more accurate with what the C64 is and thereby giving us a bit more uh, accuracy and when we're playing games and everything, I want to try to match the tint of this to what's being shown on the emulator. Okay, so that's that's too green. That's not good. And then if we bring it back the other way... Uh, I mean, that's probably about as close as I can get it with the controls that are on the back of the monitor without opening it back up again. It's still not quite right. You can see that that's definitely not too, not right. This is way too, too blue. Everything is blue here and it should be purple, more of a purplish blue. So I think I might have to actually open up the monitor again and adjust some of the fine tuning controls inside the monitor to get the colors a bit more accurate. Okay, so at this point, I opened the monitor back up and dove in, not literally, with some non-conductive tools, safety first folks when you're doing this, and was able to adjust not only the colors, but also the sub-brightness and the geometry settings to get this thing looking as good as I could. Unfortunately, the way my camera is working and the way the CRT is emitting so much light, it's going to look a little washed out probably to you as you watch this video, but it looks really good to me in person. So I apologize if this is not coming across on the, on your screen uh, like it is on my screen, but these are very, very close now to my eye. Soft reset, and we can see what the emulator looks like uh, at the basic prompt. So you can see it's uh, you know, kind of a purplish blue, really. And then if we do the same thing on the uh, actual Commodore 64 attached to this monitor, just reset it. There we go. So again, don't know if it's coming across on screen. Uh, the monitor, if I'm looking the camera, the monitor is a bit washed out, but it's not in real life. And now the tint controls are such that if I do want to make this just a bit bluer, I can do that really easily, where before I couldn't even get it into the purple range. Uh, but now I can. If I wanted a little bluer, I can just move the tint ever so slightly, and it comes up with a little bit of a bluer tint. And if I wanted a little bit more purple, I can just move it ever so slightly into the purple range. And, and that really does make it look uh, 
like a like a Commodore 64 should look. So things are looking really, really good. I'm gonna put the back back on and we'll go from there. Okay, so the last thing I wanna tackle regarding this monitor is the plastic covering that goes over the uh, monitor itself, goes over the CRT. It does provide a layer of protection, which is nice, especially if you're gonna be moving this thing around a lot. And I suppose that this thing has been moved around, I don't know, at least a dozen times or so in its lifetime. If you look at this plastic covering, as I've got the light in the background, you can kind of see all around there. On the front side of the plastic, there are some minor scratches. I would say these are not micro scratches, but minor scratches up here. There's like some scratching here. They're, they're surface scratches, but they are not, uh, uh, they're not too light and they're not too deep. They're, they're just kind of surface scratches. Then there are some scuffs, some pretty big scuffs here. And uh, there's a couple other pretty big chunks taken out over here. The inside of this actually has almost no problems at all, as you might imagine. It's just been up against the CRT, essentially, for its lifetime. So no problems on the inside. All the problems are on the outside of this plastic cover. So what I'm going to do today is I'm going to use some of this Headlight Lens Restorer from Turtle Wax. And I've had this for, I don't know, forever, it seems like. I think I used this on one of my cars at one point. And it seems like it's really meant for micro scratches and uh, discoloration, surface discoloration of the plastic. And not really meant for these deeper scratches. But I'm gonna go ahead and try this because I've never done it before. And I thought it might be worthwhile. Recently, Jan Beta. Hi, it's Jan Beta. Put out a video where he restored the top of a turntable, a plastic uh, turntable cover that, that folds down. He did a pretty nice job with it. And really to get out some of these deeper scratches, what you would need is to first start with some, say, 400 grit sandpaper and work your way down to about a 2000 grit sandpaper to get these uh, deeper scratches and scuffs really smooth. And then you could buff out the rest with a buffing wheel, uh, preferably like on a grinding wheel or something like that, and some polish. So that would be the preferred way of doing this really well and getting out these deep scratches. I don't think these will come out using this method, but I figured I would try it anyway and just see if we can clear this up. And then maybe sometime later, I'll go back and do a serious restoration, plastic restoration using the sandpaper and buffing wheel, as I mentioned. But for now, let's go ahead and try this turtle wax. It's got a couple of different uh, levels, I guess, of cleaning. You start out with just some kind of lens clarifying compound to see if that will work. And then they do have some polishing compound and different grits of abrasive pads that you can use to get even, uh, even more cleaning, I guess, or even more polishing out of it. So I'm going to spend the next 20 minutes or so using this and see what kind of difference I can make on this plastic cover. Okay. Sorry for pointing this thing up at the, uh, fluorescent light here, but I wanted to show you the results after doing the first level of cleaning with the cleaning solution or cleaning compound, lens cleaning compound that they gave. So this is without any of the abrasive pads, but here's the cover for the monitor. And that top part is what I did with the cleaning compound and the bottom is left untouched down there. So you can see it's kind of more blurry. Maybe you can see those micro scratches in the plastic there. So that, that first layer actually did get quite a bit of that out. There's still some scratches, but the results are not bad. They're not great, but not bad. And certainly it didn't get out, of course, I don't think it's gonna get out that big scratch like that. That'll come later, but uh, yeah, it actually made quite a bit of difference. Now I mentioned on my last video that using these melamine sponges works great, but they are a light abrasive. And that, what I thought I would do just for fun to see what an effect these can have is to use these on a little section over here that I haven't treated with anything yet and just use a little water and a melamine sponge and see what happens to the, the micro scratches or other scratches that are on this side of the plastic. So that's what I'm gonna do next. I'll be right back to show you the results. Okay, well, I got done with uh, the melamine sponge and it really had no effect. This is the area over here that I did with the melamine sponge. And it looks basically just like the side over here that I did nothing to. So yeah, yeah it was a nice try, but worth the test. Melamine sponge does unfortunately not help with scratch plastic in this case. 
Okay, well now that I'm good and sweaty, um, let's see. Here's the results. So there's the upper one that I did just with the cleansing compound. And then the bottom part, I don't know if you can see it. In fact, I can't even see it right now. It's right here. Right there was where that scuff was. And you can still see a little bit of a distortion there. So it looks like there's, but you have to kind of know where it is and be looking for it. So actually those polishing abrasive uh, pads and the oil that they provided to polish it with actually did work out pretty well. However, uh, as a result, it did leave some more micro scratches where the abrasive was. And I had to go back in three more times with the cleansing solution or cleansing compound to get those micro scratches mostly out. If I look very closely, I can still see where I use those abrasive pads there, but it looks remarkably better than it did originally. I still have some major scratches and I'm not gonna go over all of those because uh, it's a lot of work. And I think I'll, if I know I'm gonna go back over this anyway with some sandpaper and a buffing tool, then I'm just, I'll come back and do that later. This is pretty good for now. And it's in much better shape than it was when I started. Okay, the only thing left I need to do is clean up this case and that will be done for the most part with just some regular old Windex. It should get things cleaned up nicely. The stickers up here, I'll be peeling those off. In fact, this one's already pretty much off, so that's nice. Uh, but I can see this one is stuck on there pretty well. Let's just see if this one wants to come off as easy as that other one. I don't know, let's see. Ooh, no, no, that one's not coming off very easily either. So yeah, I'll be using my Ronsonol cleaner to get the sticker gunk off of here once I get the paper removed, maybe with some hot air. I know a lot of you were recommending that last time, so I'll use a hot air gun, heat up these stickers a little bit and see if they come off a little bit easier, and then use the Ronsonol, Ronsonol to uh, finish getting the gunk off of here. But there's some scuff marks on here. There's some black scuff marks here. At least I think that's a scuff mark. It might be some marker. And there's some black scuff marks here and some more white scuff marks back here. And so one of the people that I often talk to uh, in some chat programs, as it were, uh, is, he goes by the name of Lucar there, but I, he has a YouTube channel and I'll link to that down below. And he recommended this SIF cream. And uh, yeah, so I'm gonna try this for getting off some of these scuff marks. He said it's all natural and it cleans really well. It's, it's a, it is a bit of an abrasive and it's for, you know, uh, sink sinks and, and countertops and things like that to get them really clean and it, it's all natural. So I figure I would give this a try and if it doesn't work, why I'll go back to my tried and true methods. So it says to apply this to a damp sponge or cloth and wipe it in and then just wipe it off. So that's what we're gonna try. Let's see if it works. This reminds me a lot of, uh, uh, what is it? Soft scrub or something like that. It comes in just, just like a little, it's just a little white solution here, but it reminds me a lot of that soft scrub stuff. So let's just see what happens when I use this on this black mark here. Like I said, if this is marker, it's not gonna come off. So that one is kind of coming off. Yeah, but it's not not great. So maybe that's some marker. Let's go ahead and tackle some of these other scuff marks back here. Yeah. It's doing something. But let's just try these white scuff marks on the back here. See what happens with those. Okay, yeah. This is actually working pretty well on the white scuff marks. So it could be that these other scuff marks are made of something else, but Got the white scuff marks off pretty easily. Yeah, that worked quite well. I mean, it's, uh, I'll, I'll go over that with some Windex now and it'll take any remaining residue off. So I guess for some things it, it might work well. Uh, you know, what he was saying was he uses this because it doesn't discolor the plastic or remove too much of the outer layer of plastic like a melamine sponge would. This melamine sponge is still a little wet. Let's just use this melamine sponge and see if it'll get out that black mark right there. There we go. Good as new, and I'll use this leftover SIF to clean that up. And it's all good. The melamine worked on this one and the SIF worked on this one. I guess it's one more tool that you can add to your tool bag because a lot of times it's good to start with something that's less abrasive and less uh, uh, damaging 
than it is to do it the other way. Start with something that's really, really damaging and work your way backwards. So yeah, I'll be keeping this sif around and maybe trying it for some of these difficult stains. And if it doesn't work, you can always go to another method. Oh yeah, and if you were wondering about how the sound is out of the speaker, it's actually pretty incredibly good. It just has a single speaker, but you can just listen to the Ghosts and Goblins soundtrack on this. Um, it sounds actually fantastic. Well, I'm really glad it was easy to fix this particular monitor. I didn't have to go to too much trouble and it cleaned up very nicely. I absolutely love the fact that this brown monitor, the light brown up here, dark brown in the back and around the edges, completely matches a breadboard Commodore 64 with the dark brown keys and the uh, brown outer shell here. I mean, it looks like it was just made for each other. And as you can see, it plays really nicely. Although I will say, I haven't edited this video yet, but it was super hard because of the uh, CRT was pretty bright and it was hard to capture the clarity of the graphics on it. In fact, right now, it may be difficult to see this on the camera, but in actuality, as I'm looking at it, even with the plastic reattached to the uh, CRT itself, I can see right through this. It doesn't get in the way. It doesn't cause any glare or anything, but I'm sure it does on the camera. So I apologize for that. It's super hard to shoot these things sometime, but you'll just have to take my word for it. It's looking great. The colors are looking great. The sound is great. And I'm going to be using this as my main monitor for Commodore 64 videos, probably for quite a while to come, just because it's working so well. My guess is that this was probably a medium to low hour set. And so being able to get this, fix it up, and have it working again is a, going to be a real treat as I play games and explore different aspects of the Commodore 64 in the future. So I hope you liked this video. If you did, go ahead and give it a thumbs up. And a special thanks to my patrons. I've got a survey going on right now for things that you might want to ask, and I'll be addressing that in a video to patrons. So if you're not a patron, now's a great time to sign up even for a month uh, in order to get your questions in. If you've ever wanted to ask me a question, about how I do my show or, or me personally or anything like that, go ahead over to Patreon and sign up today and fill out that survey um, on my Patreon channel or website or whatever it is. But until next time, thanks for watching. Patrons receive ad-free and early access to content after the episode commentary and of course, your name in the credits. If you liked that episode, here's a few more you might enjoy, and I thank you for your support. End of line.